Hey everybody, uh, welcome to this next video. Uh, I'm here with Sarab to help me with some lighting pipeline. How's it going, Sarab? Hey, Danny, how's how's it going? Um, Fantastic. It's going all right. Just sitting here, chilling on my Saturday, just, you know, helping people out with some lighting stuff. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> Definitely. So, uh, yeah, I just have uh, I just have this kind of like our track that was Tyler was working on for the castle. Uh, we have some audio going on and everything, and I just wanted to kind of learn more about the lighting pipeline, kind of like uh, pick your brain a little bit. So. Yeah, of course. So, like, one of the biggest aspects, like, um, you know, that you need to dive into when, when you're considering lighting is, one is, like, how how dynamic is your world going to be? Like, what are the different moving parts that's involved with the decisions you take with the design aspect that impacts lighting? right um and if i wanted to break it down in the most high level language um whenever a lighting artist basically lights a scene and sort of like you know uses uh, or tries to achieve something called gi which you would have heard a lot of times global illumination yeah. it's basically trying to mimic the real world phenomenon of light bouncing around and carrying properties of the material it's bouncing off and then lighting up the scene so the whole that like literally that aspect the gi becomes such a huge factor in considering the workflow the solutions that you want to pick for lighting a game or a project um like for example you'll have you'll have completely baked solution for gi or global illumination which go on to textures called light maps or you have a semi big solutions which work with conjunction of like probes, which are uh, these 3D virtual spheres that store lighting information and then have also have light maps. Or you have like a completely dynamic real time solution like the RTX cards or the ray tracing that, that we have had in the past five to six years. Um, so yeah, like, like there's definitely a lot of planning and pre-production or even like a uh, pipeline planning that goes into lighting before a lighting artist can actually jump in and light start lighting a scene that sounds like it yeah there's a, a lot more involved than i think most people could think about you know that it's like um yeah i, I know that I, just like in, in a lot of my games that I've, I've worked on in the past like it lighting was never a full pipeline like we kind of just kind of threw it in where we thought it might be necessary but it it kind of I think that we missed a whole lot of potential there for sure. So. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's funny cause like lighting in games, um, is, is, is like pro I would argue that it's probably the most, uh, defining factor for how good a game looks or like when someone says that the graphics in a game is like so good is like, I would say, I would argue that the lighting is good in that game. Like I can, I can say that you can have a low poly, uh, simple textured, model that's in a scene and then having it lit beautifully will push the uh, visual quality so much more than having that other way around where you have like a really high fidelity model with really good textures uh, and then having a poor lighting in that on that model will not look as good so i feel like it's something that's super important but also very often uh, misunderstood and not given priority because not all studios have the resources to resources to sort of like focus on lighting that makes sense yeah so, so how i guess how extensive like how many like actual lights because we have this like this main uh, global light uh in the scene and um it's kind of like this the, the sun uh lighting right, and everything right. but um uh, for like if i was going to talk about something about like the interior of this um yeah. if you had to estimate how many lights do you think that would be proper uh even smaller or whatever kind of lights that might be appropriate for this kind of little area right so again that would that would that's such a broad question and that depends on so many factors um for example like are we going with a completely big solution where we're burning those light map information into uh, 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 uh burning the lighting information onto a light map mm. or are we doing a semi uh, uh dynamic and, and and static solution or just completely real-time solution like with every specific approach that you take you have a specific overhead on performance and how things change and how uh, how you can budget 
like how much you can spend on these aspects right so mm-hmm. i can um uh, i can quickly kick off by going on a high level tech stuff uh, by by describing um uh, these solutions if if that's going to help sure yeah absolutely um so the biggest factor for picking with solution or which what kind of uh, mixture of lighting you want would be one the scale of the world that you're building okay um like for example if you have um uh if you have a game that's like that's it's got like just a one single map or like just uh, a level that's tiny and just a few uh meters a square meters wide or just like uh look what you have right now is it's comparatively a smaller map it's exa- it's not basically gta 5 or yeah, like a not, huge open world, like skyrim right? or something right <laughs> exactly so like for example so one would be what's the scale of the world you're building uh that 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 goes into factoring what kind of solution you want the second one is what's the complexity of the world you're building right, right? um what are the um what are the moving parts like how much dynamic life do you have in this world like how many things in this in the scene is changing like this this is this is level have a moving sun does it have a spinning it has a bunch of spinning uh cars around in the background or moving like background models like you know maybe like a uh, uh like a chopper flying around uh audience everywhere else all those ambient noise which comes with a little bit uh you know basically all the ambient stuff that you put in for in terms of aesthetics can also impact what solution impact what solution you want to pick for lighting and the next one would be your the state the, the design choice that impacts the dynamic state of your lighting like for example something like um the last of us and uh Uh, you know the newer last of us mm-hmm. and something like ghost of tsushima which which is basically both in the current generation and came uh less than one two months apart they have completely different lighting solutions in terms of global illumination because one uh one is a open world game which has a complete 24 day cycle where the sun and the moon follow a specific path in the sky and it's constantly changing and there has to be a more pre-cached or real time solution for lighting mm-hmm. in such a case uh but then something like last of us 2 can sort of like benefit from having a fixed sun in a level or a fixed position of a moon or position of a sun oh, so it yeah. can basically pick a more uh forgiving solution which is a little bit more static and it's a little bit more different right so yeah depending on some of the design choices of your game like your lighting solutions will change um and i'm assuming like having something like a dynamic day cycle is not something you've thought of or maybe not even considered for this project yeah um i think for this Because I, I think with like The Last of Us, they they kind of benefit from having a specific mood for a specific like scene or something. Mm-hmm, like, uh, mm-hmm. oh, it's dark and it's snowy. You know, you're mm-hmm. kind of scared or whatever. Um, I think this probably would have a similar feel to it. Um, mm-hmm. However, I think that um, in the long run, we probably would want to have different uh, weather or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, mm-hmm. Like, so if you have the same track, well, one one time you play, it might be rainy or snowy, another time it might be mm-hmm. just, uh, sunny, but we wouldn't have anything, I think, dynamic where the sun would be moving for sure, so. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, yeah, in, in that case, like, you can have a little bit more static solution for the scene. So I'm going to quickly um, recap what, what GI is, or global illumination is, and because that... just that uh that aspect basically defines what solutions that you need to pick absolutely so whenever you in game engines whenever you pull a light um for example like if you just pull a spotlight somewhere um if you if you can just do that oh, right sure. now yeah. I'll, i'll show you uh, let me maybe go into like a uh darker area so you can see the light okay let's get into this uh hallway area so the spotlight 
Mm-hmm. I just pull a spotlight. Um, and then like, let's just say that, you know, in the real world, you have a spotlight, right? Like right. basically it's a, it's, it's a source that it has a specific angle and a specific um, intensity, right? And then if you were shining that, let's say against the wall on the right, um and and in 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 the real world the light would basically hit the surface on the wall and depending on the uh the incoming light uh and some of the properties like what's the temperature of that light what's the intensity of that light and what's the color of that light or which is also the temperature right. so basically what's the intensity what's the color of the light and based on those parameters and based on the surface properties of the light of uh, of the uh, of the material it's hitting it's hitting basically like is it is it striking like a a a, a gold uh plate or is it hitting a fabric white fabric or is it like striking a concrete material so depending on what um you know material it's actually hitting the light would be absorbed and it would absorb specific wavelengths of the color on the of the incoming light and it would bounce off the remaining unabsorbed light, right? right. So, in engines, um, unless you're you're talking about something like ray tracing or another phenomena or, or, or a different method called light propagation volumes, which uh, uh, which you probably won't be using because they're expensive. Right. In engines, the bouncing or the 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 secondary bounce of light is not calculated in real time. Okay. So right now the hot spot you see from the spotlight is uh, currently uh, because the light is set to stationary on the right side as you can see it. Currently that hot spotlight is basically the first bounce, right? Because mm-hmm. if the light, if you imagine a light ray of coming from the spotlight, it's going towards the wall and it's striking that and it's bouncing off and coming towards the camera or your eye right, right. so that's base so you see that hot spot because that's the first bounce of the light yeah but then in the real in the real world this first bounce would like there'll be so many rays that bounce off in different direction depending on the incoming incident rays and then like then it would carry the secondary bounce and then illuminate the surfaces around Right, like it right. would illuminate the wall or the floor, depending oh, like on how the light is bouncing. Like if it was coming from this angle, it might do like something like this, like a bounce exactly. Here. Okay. So that phenomenon of having bounce lighting is nothing but global illumination, uh, gotcha. which engines don't do that predominantly in real time because it's really expensive to. Right. Uh, but then, then you go into the aspects of uh, a completely baked or cache solution or offline rendered solutions. And then you have mixed lighting solution and you have real time solution. Mm. Like if you look at the mobility of uh, on the right hand side on the tab. So mobility. Uh, yeah. So the, the three mobilities you see there in the tab, the static, stationary and movable um, on a high level briefly tell you what, or which aspects of the uh, the light or the components of the light is being uh, baked or being uh, done real time. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So, and there's, there's a huge combination of it and I can, I can show you the Unreal's document for it. So the next thing, so basically, yeah, that's that the bounce lighting is basically GI our global illumination. And most of the tools that every engine basically evolves to towards today is trying to find smarter and better ways to achieve GI. Okay. And that's that's what it is. Uh, and the next aspect of lighting is the components that come with each light. Uh, so in 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 terms of in terms of reflections uh, and for the sake of understanding or trying to mimic light in 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 digital world uh, uh, as opposed to real world we separate reflections into two aspects one is called diffuse reflections uh, one is called specular reflections okay. um, uh, you might have to pull up uh, a, uh, a google page for this or i can share my screen too 
I don't know how that impacts your recording though. Let's see if I can pull it up. <clears throat> okay. Um, I will bring it over. Okay. Uh, if you did, if you search like diffuse versus specular reflections. D I F F U S A. Diffused was a specular reflection. Yeah, specular reflections. Okay. Um, let's probably go through the first first one, <clears throat> the first link. Like in here, you think? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think there's a, if you scroll down, I'm pretty sure there's like a small simulation that shows you the reflections. Was it not this website? Huh, that was, okay, if you just scroll up all the way, mm -hmm. um, a little bit down, sorry. You're okay. Uh, the next image, yeah, so, that, yeah, there you go. So it gives you, this difference between specular reflection, different diffuse reflection. So a diffuse reflection is basically what um, uh, you will, uh, what ninety percent of the materials will exhibit. Um, again, uh, basically, if you have a surface and then you have an incoming light, and uh, let's say the incoming light has all all the wavelengths of color, basically, it's white. So in terms of digital world, it's RGB, right? So let's say that the incoming light is has RGB or 111 or white colored. Okay. And depending on the surface properties that the light is hitting and uh, uh, depending on the intensity of the surface mm. properties, that the bounced light will be different. So in the image in, in, in on your screen, what you see right there is saying like, you have these uh, light rays striking an object and then you have all these micro factors or micro surfaces <clears throat> or basically like unevenness on a surface which is like so tiny and because of those uh, differences or like you know roughness properties like the light gets diffused or basically uh, sh scattered in different directions when it's bouncing off right okay and then specular is generally uh, you know, for example, let's say that you're looking at a really shiny apple, right? You just bought an apple and if you shine a light on it and if you move around in a specific direction and like and look at the apple in, from different perspectives or different angles, you'll always find this glossy shimmer on the surface of the apple. Um, uh, if you can, if you go to you open up another Google tab, mm -hmm. let's type specular reflection. And then just uh, go to images. I'm at, uh, just type specular reflection apple. I'm sure they'll just give you the. There you go. Just yeah, open up one of the apple images. So you see that shiny glimmer on the left side of the apple. Uh, the shine, right? Like the glossy. Oh right. Yep. Effect. That's basically in, in, in real world what you call uh, a, sh a specular reflection. Um, at certain given ang angle of the surface and based on where the camera is or your eye is, the incoming light will be reflected off completely. So even though, okay, I'm going to back up a little bit and explain um, why we see colors. Uh, on surfaces, like we see uh, materials exhibit specific colors because they absorb every other wavelength of color that's incident on it other than the color that they show. What I mean is like if an apple is red and you shine a white line on this a white light on this apple, it absorbs all the wavelengths of light except red. It bounces back red. 
and that red basically reaches your eye and that's why you see the red color okay. so that's one of the diffuse properties of an apple but then when it comes to specular highlights regardless of what the uh, color of that object is the specular highlight is going to is going to be the color of the incident light or the source light so that's why you see a white specular highlight when you have a white light shining on a red apple and specular highlight is dependent of angle of the camera or or, or your eyes perce- perception and diffuse reflections aren't um it yeah i'm trying to explain it in a high level sorry That's so basically <laughs> yeah basically you have two different kinds of reflections you have direct uh, you have diffuse reflections and you have specular reflections mm-hmm. and in both diffuse and specular you have something called first bounce and secondary bounce uh the first bounce is like what i was talking about um uh right now when the light hits the surface from the so- uh, from the source and then it bounces off and hits your eye that's the first bounce okay but the secondary bounce any consecutive bounces are uh, uh, after the first bounce is called secondary bounce uh in other terms you have direct reflection and indirect reflections and both diffuse reflections and specular reflections have that and to go in deeper you call them direct diffuse indirect diffuse or direct specular indirect specular um y- yeah it's going to get complicated if i keep going <laughs> in but i just i just sort of want to like touch that yeah. and then the so you have those two components the uh, specular diffuse and the third aspect is the shadows so you have three components of light which matters uh main the main things that matter and then out of all these three you can have a combination of baked solution plus a uh, real time solution for individual components so what i mean is like you can have a light that's baking uh both the uh, baking all the three components so baking your shadows baking your reflections like specular reflections and your um um uh, uh diffuse reflections and then you you can have a solution which bakes only the shadows and everything else is in real time or you have solution which is like the shadow is real time the other two components are baked uh so yeah it's it it gets it gets complicated and basically what you see right there in the mobility the static stationary and movable mm-hmm. basically gives you that combination of uh real time and baked solutions um there is a uh, there's a unreal document for that if you wanted to read it uh it, it it will try to explain it to you a little bit better but then you'll have to sort of dive into understanding the types of reflections a little bit better so Yeah my point is like for you have these components and then GI is basically with indirect uh, reflections right that's what GI is yeah um and now going to the most uh, traditional way of having GI stored is through light maps so light maps are nothing but textures on every surface which store the reflection information so if you had the spotlight shining on a texture or shining on an object and then there's something called baking process where the whole engine sort of takes all these lights in the scene into account and then basically calculates it and shoots this virtual light rays behind the scenes and then basically paints the lighting information onto a separate texture called light map and it can uh, and depending on the type of light it can either bake the reflections or bake the shadows or do both and that's where i was like oh, you have different combination of the components being real time uh, and that's that's what basically light maps are so in a game like basically in 2020 or even like from the past 5 to 10 years uh we don't have any as far as consoles and pc games are uh uh you know a concern mm-hmm. we don't have any solution that's completely baked um because one of the biggest advantages of having only light maps is that that means none of the lights 
get updated in real time when they're moving around if they have to move around in the game right right like you can have a light shining on something and if everything is just shaded onto a light map texture and if the light moves it's not really going to update that in real time because it's a pre-baked offline light map that just like sort of pasted on the prop oh yeah um, okay okay yeah so but then like then you talk about like how more and more games like the things that's always moving there's like characters it's like in your game there's going to be cars and there's going to be like this ambient props it's maybe even crowds right right like how are you going to light those things and that's where the semi uh uh dynamic semi-static solution sort of come in uh, uh so yeah that's one that's obviously one limitation and the second biggest drawback is every light map you bake is a texture that occupies a disk space and also is a texture that occupies space on your ram right, right. so if you have a massive world and you're baking light maps you're gonna have like a few you know gbs of just light maps apart from the textures for each prop mm. being like you know generated and that has to be dynamically loaded into so that's your next consideration and the third one is basically if you have any uh game that has a completely dynamic system which is basically open world games with day and night cycle you can't really bake light maps because nothing gets you know uh you know updated in real time so you have to come with with this special solutions right. um i'm not going to go through those a uh, combination of solutions for the sake of just keeping it simple uh but i am going to say like for something like what you're showing me right now we will have to use um uh, a mixed lighting system and i feel like the scene itself is you know it's it's pretty decent in scale or it's like small enough that i can you can have like most of the props baked baking light maps okay uh which comes to the next aspect which uh people really need to uh consider in terms of modeling is modular modeling uh when you have big structures like the castle that you're just like in right now mm -hmm. you will no game which has been doing this for years will never model this in big chunks of just one single prop right you have to separate this out like the pillar itself like the small cylindrical pillar if it has to be like three pieces or four pieces depending on uh how big the scale is because one if you make it into one huge giant prop the optimization is bad because it 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 can't unload and load the whole thing when the whole thing is in view the second thing is like your texture resolution has to be super massive for it to look even decently well if you right. have such big scale models right so the same aspects of environment art with modular uh with modular modeling comes into light maps too so if you press alt 0 alt 0 zero yeah alt 0 okay there you go so what you're seeing right now is uh <laughs> unreal's visualization for light map density okay uh so so the way unreal works by default is when you import a model unreal takes your uv channel for your textures the existing uv channel for your textures it mm -hmm. duplicates that and then it rearranges the uv shells in that channel to basically not have them overlapping and then that new channel that's been duplicated and then rearranged is called a light map. Okay, yeah, yeah. Dang. So, and exactly. So basically what you're seeing right now is a grid view of the light map that until generated when you imported these models. So, if you click on any model uh and so oh, oh it's all one huge chunk, I see. Yeah, um, for the most part, yeah. If you can let's just drag a cube unreal's basic cube so I can show you sure so if you just drag a cube and uh escape hit escape okay now click on that 
Uh, if, if you go in a little closer, you can see the grid better. Oh, yeah. 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 Now, open the model uh, through hitting static mesh. Just go to the model itself. Like, double click the static mesh on the right side. Right. On oh, the oh, right here. Yeah. Uh, no, on the bottom under, oh, you sorry. see the cube? Yeah, double. Yeah. Right, right. Now, on the top toolbar section is something called UV. All the way right on here. the right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you click on that and um, UV channel zero, if you click on zero, this is basically the UV for the texture Unreal or maybe whoever imported this model came with. And it's actually uh, a, a, a stacked shells. So you, there's actually like six faces that's being stacked and you can't really see it. Oh. So now let's go to UV channel two. Oh, sorry, one. Yeah. Okay. Now it's the same thing. So what Unreal did was like it duplicated the first one and it unstacked everything. That's why now you see six sites. Right, okay. So now this one is tagged as automatically a light map, uh, or which goes into UV channel two. And for light map, you can um, there's all you can never have stack shells. Like you need to, you can't have overlapping overlapping shells right. for light maps. Uh, and that's why uh, that's why Unreal recognizes each individual shell and it, like rearranges itself. Now, if you just close this window and hit escape because if you select something it shows you mm -hmm. so the reason why you see a different color is because the view you're in right now tells you it makes it just does this like resolution by the scale of that object in terms of size and it tells you if the texel density would be enough to have lighting quality bakes on that light map be sharp enough uh, okay so that's why all the the big uh, very low texture density, whatever is blue, is, and then this is a exactly. So blue means that Unreal is like, oh, the resolution for this massive model is not going to be enough if you want good quality light map on it. What does the yellow mean, or is that uh, part of it? I'll get into that just a quick, oh, just a sure. little bit. Sure. So if you click on the cube again, where did the cube go? Right here. Oh, there it is. Now green obviously means okay, that's a pretty good number. Um, uh, you know, it's like, I, I feel, it's, uh, Unreal is like, yeah, green is good. Like, the res texture density is going to be good. If you bake any light map information, it's going to look good. Like, That's it's going to be crisp. Yeah. It's not going to be, you know, whatever. Uh, now, cl click on the cube and, like, scale it down all the way a little bit. To make it a tiny cube. Oh, yeah, there you go. Now, hit escape. Now, you see that it's starting to turn red. Now, it's orange. So, basically, now it's like, okay... The light map doesn't need to have a huge resolution uh, for this scale. Like that's an overkill. You don't need this much resolution because it's so small that you can get away with the lower Got pixel it. density. Yeah. Uh, now, if you click on a cube and go to the details panel and type in resolution, light map re or just res resolution. So, oh, or just res, I guess. You see the under lighting, you have something called overridden light map. If you under lighting, if you just hover over it, yeah, that one. If you hover over it, uh, what is it called? The whole thing. Um, over, oh, oh, let me do the. Board. Yeah, there you go. So by default, uh, every light map that's created is basically 64 by 64 pixels. Okay. Um, so imagine that you have all these props in the world, which are like, maybe the hero props are like 4K, depending on the size, or 2K. Then most of the background are maybe like 1K or 5 to well. So for every prop that has like these textures, it's going to have light map textures, which also have a specific resolution. Okay. So in, 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 in a bigger picture, light map, memory is like is a small footprint compared to the texture size but it's still consuming some memory right right so by default you have 64 by 64 pixels so if you hit that if you override that and then um uh, turn that down to let's say 16 now you can see that the grid changed because the texel density changed and if you escape from that um 
you can see it became green again mm -hmm. now it's like unreal is like okay yeah 16 by 16 is you know pretty decent for this scale like and now you just basically saved on uh you know resolution of light maps that's cool so, so basically you want to make sure that things are typically green or around the green right i mean not really like not really. personally i feel like unreal oh does a, has a little bit of an overkill when it comes to estimating the texel density okay like like it, you will understand that once you keep doing it again and again in Unreal. Right. Like I, like with more experience and practice, you learn to use. Uh, I, I bleed into blue a lot more than I have it on green because mm. some aspects of light maps is a little bit more unforgiving. For example, if you're baking just direct uh, diffuse, and if you're not baking shadows, you can get away with low resolution light maps. Shadows are the ones which are way more noticeable if they're low resolution. Oh, right. So if you're baking shadows, which generally I don't do because because of the, you know, most of the um, real-time nature of lights, I generally don't bake shadows. But if you do it, did, like shadows expect, you know, you know, a really high resolution light map because... You can you can you can notice it if a shadow is not crisp. You know what I'm saying? Will it be kind of like fuzzy or pixelated. If exactly, it'll right. be like fuzzy pixelated. So some com it depend. It, like like I said, it's it's hard to like if you have a world this big. Imagine trying to put everything in a green, texel density resolution. You're probably gonna you're gonna you're gonna lose a lot more information than you need to. Right. And also, like, if you have a backdrop, which is like a super LOD3 model all the way in the back, and even if the shadow is not, like, pretty clear on that, like, who cares? You're not going to see it. Exactly. So it's all about uh, sort of budgeting and knowing how to do that, which, you know, in terms of lighting, so it comes with practice and experience. Um, in your, so, so for your project, you will probably... I. I would suggest that my opinion is like you can get away with having um, mainly baked light maps because way bigger worlds do that. For example, Fallen Order, um, the new Star Wars game, oh, yeah. actually has big solution. Um, uh, a lot of Forza games do. Uh, yeah, I imagine it, especially um, like racing type of games. If you're if you're flying through, um, I don't know. Yeah, I think if you're if you're kind of going through a track quickly, then you probably. I don't I don't know if I guess if it's pre-rendered. I don't know. You know if it's baked in and everything, it may be different. But if they have dynamic uh, lighting and you're going through it really quickly, then it might hurt frame rate or um, that kind of thing. I'm not fully sure on that, but. Um. Right, but then like again, like uh, a lot of times, especially when you have. Uh, next year's scene and you'll have the most prominent source of your light mm. would be your sunlight or your direction light right or your moonlight if it's during a night time and then the secondary most prominent light source is actually your sky in an exterior scene mm. your sky defines literally how the composition of your light and the colors is going to be an overcast sky versus a sunny sky versus a night sky have so much difference in the terms of how they light the world beneath them oh yeah and that's really important and basically the direction light like no pun intended it gives the directionality of the light source <laughs> um Absolutely. yeah so like in, in terms of what's important your direction light since yours is an interior scene and you have tracks and like you can see the sky that becomes really important and then how would it I would just keep it as a semi big solution where the light is uh shadows are in real time because all your cars need to be casting shadows in real time all your dynamic objects need to be casting shadows in real time that makes sense um, yeah. uh but yeah like I said it's those are all small details which are really important but also like you can probably sit through and go through that later when it comes to breaking down the tech aspect of it and that's where the pipelines come in right and that's where the workflow matters absolutely so for example yeah so most of your gi can be baked or burnt so when i say baked in when you if can you click on the small arrow next to build 
next. on the all the way on the top on your oh here uh yeah next yeah if you click on that mm -hmm. so uh, there's an option called build lighting only don't cl click that but that's basically when you click that behind the scenes what unreal is doing it's going to freeze up your system because it needs to use the cpu completely right it basically what it does is it 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 does those virtual light ray photons or whatever being fired in the background calculates the lighting information and burns them onto a light map like just the way i described before and it basically does that like that's what baking slash building slash like burning light maps mean it basically pre-caches that and puts the gi or information onto the light maps um and the depending on the quality of bakes depending on the scale of the world depending on the quality of the lights the number of lights the 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 time for building a baking light uh, can take hours or days or sometimes weeks Jeez. um depending yeah like it, it takes a time it's an offline renderer and basically baking is a process for we went back we used uh, something called uh, cloud rendering or cloud baking where we used unreal swarm agent which is basically a task manager and we used the power of cloud computing to bake uh, light maps from all 12 systems onto one level so basically use the 12 cpus across the machine in a network <laughs> to bake light maps and that decreased the bake hours from 10 hours to 20 minutes so that's pretty awesome if you have that kind of uh i guess machinery if you have that kind of budget and that kind of exactly i mean yeah you guys could do it too, right? Like maybe you don't have access to 12, but like you can have like three or four or five, uh, whatever, you know, it's always better than one. So there's definitely ways to speed that up. Mm. Uh, but but you be warned and remember that if you're going with the static solution, which I think you should be, there's going to be an iteration process and just sort of like baking process that's going to take a while. Absolutely. Yeah, it kind, of, um, it kind of reminds me of, like, render farms that, like, Pixar and exactly. stuff does. Yeah. Yes, we, we call them render farms, too. Oh, so, cool. <laughs> uh, what Pixar uses, the render farms, are exactly that. Awesome, yeah. They're baking light. <laughs> so, uh, um, the quality in movies and in, in, in animated or CGI is a little bit, it's way more higher than what we do. Uh, and sometimes a frame can take like hours or days on a crazy um, on a crazy powerful system just because of the visual quality of the output has yeah when i when i found out about like uh udems and that kind of thing for uh for animation pipeline where you can mm -hmm. basically a character might be like the equivalent of tons of or like maybe like four or five or six 4K for yeah. um, for an animation pipeline. I was absolutely shocked, and sometimes even more than that. Um, like a steering wheel in an animation might be like a one K or four four K map by itself. Or and for games, like a character might be four K. <laughs> and um, exactly. between yeah. lighting and just texture fidelity, just like wow, like no no matter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's there's so many similarities between like film and games but also it's but also at the same time it's so different yeah like it's it's important to know like i, I feel like those guys are our neighboring or basically the other side of the coin when it comes to the content we create but also it's important to know that there's so much there's a distinction because of games being uh um uh, a real-time content right Right. Like you have to run games in real time. You can't just pre-render a movie and then play that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it would just be a cinematic or something, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. So that's that. And then basically, sorry, what was I talking about? Yeah, we were we were kind of just discussing like all the different uh, fidelity uh, for for like this and um, and also like how different games have uh, just different standards of lighting 
Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, so the next one is uh, you asked me what the yellow one is. So if you click yeah. on the uh, the the light uh, the cube, and then and uh, go to the details panel and just like remove the resolution, backspace that. Now under mobility, if you turn this cube to either stationary or mobile, so you can do yeah do stationary and hit escape now. Um, and mm -hmm. it's going to turn yellow. So basically yellow in this debug menu, what this means that is the light maps will not be baked on this object. Oh, okay, got it. Okay. So the basically all your mobile props, your cars, your hero, champions, slash champions, all these guys who are like traveling across the world mm -hmm. in the track, they can't have baked light maps because right. they're moving and things are changing. Um, <laughs> so those things are going to be yellow. Okay, yeah, because that'd be kind of funny because I guess the, the vehicles would have baked light maps at the starting line and they'll look really stupid. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you have skeletal mesh, they're automatically tag, tagged as mobile. Oh, cool. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think there is a way to override that and bake light maps if I'm not wrong, but like it 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 makes no sense. <laughs> right, it makes sense. Yeah, let's say like yeah, like well, a statue wouldn't really have a skeleton. I mean, it wouldn't need to have any kind of like rigging or anything like that. So yeah, it, it would right, make no sense right, to yeah. <laughs> that. So exactly. So th that's what yellow means basically. Cool. And there's also a difference between uh, what's the difference between stationary and movable. Uh, uh, maybe the now is a good time to sort of go to refer to that uh, sure. Unreal page. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, I, I won't go through that. So I'll sort of just like point it to you towards you, so uh, you can basically go through that. and understand it. Just type in mobility, actor mobility UE4. Actor M mobility UE4. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I think that's the one. The first one? Yeah. Okay. It's, yeah, it's, this one's going to get complicated real quick. Because uh, it has a combination for every possible combination of prop versus light. What I mean is a static object has a different influence from a static light as opposed to a static object having a different influence from a stationary light. It's the same way the other way around. So it's going to be basically, uh, I think it's, I don't know, is it 16 combination? My ma math isn't very good. So <laughs> there's a difference. And you can see that they explain what each thing is right? Um, in terms of prop and light. You can, again, you don't have to know this in complete detail, but it's good to sort of understand what these differences are because a lot of them affect performance directly. And it's better to use uh, something that you something cheaper when you don't have to use something more expensive, basically. So that makes sense. Yeah, it's it's cool that you have this kind of a documentation for uh, kind of de describing or defining what these would do. Yeah. 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 Unreal is is notorious for not having that many documentation. Um, but I do think their forums are pretty good. Like there's all a bunch of people who have already experienced problems and they're like, oh, this happened, what well, What do I do? And there's some dude who knows everything and then they'll be like, okay, here you go, this is what you do. And I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense. So, so I have a quick question. I'm assuming it might be movable. So like when we'll have, um, say, headlights for the vehicles, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. If they were to be mm -hmm. able to flicker on and off, depending on, if you're in a tunnel or if you're out in the, you know, out in the sun or something, uh, would that be considered a movable light since you could remove it or uh, move it like that? Or would it be just with the stationary? So the only reason why you would, um, okay. So since we're already here on this can of worms, sure. so st stationary light, uh, bakes indirect, uh, diffuse reflections. Okay. And it precaches or the shadows and the direct diffuse reflections are both real time. And the dynamic light, basically, the direct diffuse reflection is real time and it does not have any indirect diffuse reflection unless it's ray traced. Uh, and the shadows are also in real time. I know that's a lot of information and then <laughs> if it's confusing, that's okay. That's all right. 
so if, for your question if you have a light that's flickering and also moving in space that has to be movable but if you have a light that's flickering but it's not moving as in like maybe a, a street lamp that's just flickering mm. that can be stationary uh, okay yeah gotcha um so, so so what if like a what if like it was like a um, fire right would fire be considered movable since it kind of it kind of moves around a little bit or would it be uh, stationary? Sure, but like the thing with fire is like you can use VFX lights too, uh, which I believe are like the way they're calculated behind the scenes. Our instance is a little bit better, and none of them are shadow casting. Mm. Uh, again, like dynamic shadows are expensive. Right. So if you have every light that's stationary, you don't want them to cast dynamic shadows all the time. There's also a difference between how shadows are being calculated for stationary and mobile, by the way. Um, the stationary the stationary shadows are dynamic, but it is still cheaper than the shadows coming from movable. Uh, there's again, like don't want to open that can of worms, right. but just on a high level stuff. Like there's there's a huge difference between every single combination of light and prop. Um, okay. Is that does that answer your question? Yeah, that that makes sense. Yeah. So I, yeah, and and I figured that yeah, the movable would make sense for the um, the headlights as well. So that's that's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's cool to yeah, see different things. <laughs> it's awesome. Oh yeah, it's it's def it's definitely a, it's definitely such a it's a massive uh, it's it's a huge thing, yeah. um, and it's it's hard to understand it initially. Yeah, it's no wonder they they have like um like they would have these people specifically for lighting and they have people specifically for audio. Like there's just yeah. there's just so much that people just don't consider, um, you know. And this isn't this isn't specifically taught for the most part in like traditional uh, game kind of classes and stuff like that. So this is, it's really yeah. cool. And you, you probably have to just find ways or have someone who knows about it to do it properly, you know? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I, I still think lighting was still way, uh, it was, it was still like a few years away from reaching the peak. Uh, or at least I feel like lighting has a lot of room to grow. Yeah. And it's fairly new to the industry. A lot of people don't understand lighting. Uh, and it's it's fair because like, we haven't been doing it. It's becoming a more and more AAA thing. It is a AAA thing. And it's right. becoming more recognizable in like a smaller studio or a smaller team. Uh, like films, CG and films are way ahead of us in terms of lighting because they've been here for years game dev is a new industry and mm. lighting is like evolving now now it's becoming more important uh, but i still feel like it's it's not known enough or understood properly enough for everyone to appreciate it and that that's totally fine yeah i i know for uh for artists specifically we're taught how to just light a basic scene for like marmoset or unreal to show off our props and our assets yeah but that's yeah. very very basic level kind of stuff you know like um just like if you're like a youtuber and you have lighting like in front and in back on the side of you um, exactly. that's a very standard knowledge of lighting but uh for like uh actual budget and for a mood and for you know what's what needs to be dynamic or not what needs to be static and and light maps it's this it's, uh, it's crazy there's a lot too <laughs> there is and like for me i think the biggest difference between lighting in uh films uh and lighting in cg movies and lighting in games is basically in in our industry, there's an added layer of technical uh, knowledge that you must possess to be a lighting artist because lighting gets way more complex and way more technical than people, uh, you know, know because li like have anything that involves real-time rendering, you need to understand how engines work. You need to understand where to budget your performance and like you got to be smart when it's all limited resources and running games. And making them look best at the least performance of our performance factor, right? Right. So it's it's definitely it's two sides of a coin: technical aspects and artistic uh, aspect of lighting. You need both. Dang, yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, and it's really cool to see the the density factors too. Like you can literally see just the, the textile density, like you, you're talking about, and the different exactly. colors. I didn't yeah. even know about this to be honest. Like the alt alt zero, like that's cool. <laughs> 
Yeah, I usually use it. So I don't. I usually don't use it for what it's for. <laughs> uh, I usually use it to check if I've accidentally tagged something as sta- static or stationary or movable. Uh, so if I just look at this, I look at yellow. I'm like, yeah, that's supposed to be yellow. Okay, that makes sense. That's supposed to be blue or green or red. That makes sense. Uh, most of the times, that's why I'm using it. But <laughs> hey, no. Yeah, oh. <laughs> multiple functions. Yeah. So the uh, the all so it's not always uh, you know it's it's not uh, rainbows and butterflies when it comes to baking light maps. The biggest uh, caveat is you know sitting uh, running through an offline bake for hours, which I just explained, which is like crazy, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the second one is like the memory can start increasing by a huge amount, and that's where you need to be smart in deciding what to bake light maps on and what to not so even if you have sometimes even if you have like a lot of objects that's not moving and they probably make sense to bake light maps we usually don't do that for example in this level that you're showing me right now mm. you when it goes towards a finishing of final position you're gonna have so many thousands of models in the given area right. especially when they're like Culling out, loading in and out, and just like things loading in and out. Having like thousands of them and baking light map resolution, it's going to be taking you days to do that, do the baking. And also, it's just unnecessarily adding um, texture, texture, uh, 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 memory, right? Right. Sometimes, like for example, if you have like rocks or tiny stones, and then, then you sort of like have models of tiny stones on the road somewhere you know you don't you probably benefit from making them stationary instead of static even though they never move uh, okay. because well it's not going to benefit from having baked light map on such a small tiny object in screen and second it's going to save you on the uh, big times and third it's going to save you on the memory so it's always going to be pick your battles what do we want to bake what do we not want to bake and stuff like that yeah no doubt it seems like that's a, a very common game thing is pick your battles <laughs> yeah for sure it's 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 always going to be a budgeting thing it's like it's literally dude it's literally down to like milliseconds at the end of the day mm-hmm. like especially when we do like lighting tech it's like can we afford this? We have 10 milliseconds accounted for all these systems. How much can we basically cut down? That's literally what we do. And I'm just like, yep. Comes down to numbers. It comes, comes down to like fraction of a second. That's what it is. <laughs> Dang. Yeah. Do you, do you think that so, so like uh, if you were to light a scene and everything, like would you – kind of place it where you think everything would be needed and then refine it after like when you realize the numbers or do you kind of like focus on the numbers as you're doing all the lighting um i it's a it's a super iterative process uh what i would do is like get the workflow a little bit more refined so it helps whoever is lighting if, if it's me or anyone else later to not have these problems so for example like if you have like one huge model like you just do right now mm-hmm. and people aren't aware that this is going to impact the lighting then it's it's going to be a problem later right like and then you'll be like can we change all the models now like probably not <laughs> that's where yeah that's where that's why you need to consider lighting way ahead um yeah. another the biggest aspect is like what's your artistic style by default unreal's material is pbr right. based and I would assume that your game is a little bit more stylized, which is okay. You can have a combination of stylized models and textures with realistic lighting. For example, Overwatch does that. Right. That's the idea. Uh, the stylized PBR. Yeah. Exactly. Stylized PBR. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So PBR is just, uh, it's, it's, it's become more of a buzzword than what it actually is. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's basically trying to mimic the properties of real world materials and real world lighting influences on those materials um it that gets a little that gets way more complicated too if you dive into it so i'm not going to do that <laughs> yeah. um but it's important to know that like your m- mostly your diffuse textures play a huge role on lighting um especially bounce lighting 
so if you want uh, like this yeah you just have to like if there's no diffuse texture that would be pure black or pure white uh basically like if you're let's say you're looking at the darkest substance that's naturally occurring like this char- charcoal mm-hmm. or the brightest substance which is like the snow neither of them if you're trying to mimic the real world values they're not pure white nor pure black right um uh, because if a substance is pure white or black that means they absorb 100% of light energy or reflect 100% of light energy which does not work in the real world and right. the engine and unreal does the same thing so you're going to have like a black surface somewhere and then it's going to look black even though there's like millions of lights there and having like thousands of lumens shining on it because it's absorbing every freaking lumen that you put on that <laughs> yeah because it's it's a pbr based uh render uh, it, it has the materials that you make uh, by default it's a pbr based unless you have a stylized shader that you made for your uh game right which is fine but like i i mean photorealistic games like the new call of duty or the red dead 2 it's a little bit more strict with materials and material response to lighting but you you guys are stylized you can cheat a little bit but knowing those rules before you cheat is definitely important yeah absolutely yeah i, I imagine there's a there's a huge difference in just the lighting process from yeah realism to to stylize this just exactly yeah. yeah um so that's one aspect and the I can briefly introduce the process I go through when I'm lighting a scene like this. Sure. Um I generally start when it's a block out just like the way you have it. I don't worry about uh I don't worry about GI. I don't really worry about the at- artistic vision of lighting initially. So I start with the functional uh uh result of wh- why I use the lighting, which is basically guiding the player through a map. it's easy to overdo lighting or it's easy to not use lighting enough um and it's 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 a it's a tiny it's a subtle balance between just the right amount um and i always start with okay a scene like this i know the level design i know uh in, in a game like this it's pretty evident where the track has to lead right. or where players have to go because there's a track which basically takes you around but sometimes it can be you know i played racing games where i'm like i don't know where to go even though there's a track in front of me because there's That's so much rough. noise going around right so first my process would be like okay i have this now it's a block out okay let me start sort of visualizing how i want this to look and how i co- i'm going to guide the 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 game so it could be as simple as like usually in a triple a studio like it would be like okay the art director or this look dev supervisor would be like they look at this um map and then they would be like okay how how about if we did had like a nighttime lighting scenario or like how about we had like a uh you know dusk or like dawn with like the cloud coverage to this much in the sky and then like you, and people would concept that right and then or the other way around right you'll have concept and then you'll have and then lighting artists will like okay now we have to think about it sort of start by blocking out there's something called light blocking too like i believe that's a thing i don't know if that's a word so you basically start blocking out the lighting mm. which is like okay now i know like okay it's going to be dusk i got my sunlight at this specific direction now let me see what angle or what uh, how i want my sunlight to start to like start to appear and then you think about the sky and stuff like that so you start with like those basic things and then the next would be like the functionality like i said like if you making sure that your lighting is guiding the player across the path like you want them to um like if there's multiple paths maybe one of them is getting too much importance and maybe that's not intentional and maybe lighting can help you there so the functional aspect of it so you do that um you basically um go through that and then this is going to be an iterative process and then once the i don't know if you guys have concept artists mm-hmm. but like having concept is like so i mean it's so helpful for me as a lighting artist uh because sometimes i use a lot of reference and i think most of the artists do right like references everything right it is but also like 
for I benefit a lot from movies and shots from movies. Like I use a lot of reference of movies. I just watch watch something. I'm like, okay, I love that composition and this trying to mimic that sort of thing and break it down. Uh, so yeah, if you have concept artists and then like a good sketch out of how this map should look and like in terms of like lighting, sky and directionality and stuff, that could help a lighting artist a lot. Um, so that would be the process and then you reiterate, right? And then you have to like, okay, I don't like the direction of the sun. I don't like the composition of the sky. Let's try this. Reiterate that, do that. And then like once you keep getting more towards the uh, end or the final uh, you know, stage of the map, then you start thinking about baking light, uh, light maps. Maybe you can keep doing that in a lower quality initially too, right? And then you think about reiteration. I'm like, oh, I don't like this aesthetic composition of this castle or this scene. I don't like the lights here. And you sort of, that's that's the process from start to finish. And throughout the whole process, again, you need to have uh, optimization performance in your mind when it comes to lighting. Uh, another thing that probably comes with experience with the tools that you have at disposal. Like I said, like right now, I showed you three different mobilities that impact the performance, right? Mm -hmm. Excuse me. That's literally just scratching the surface when I talk about performance and considering various aspects. Uh, yeah, so you, you have that. And then at the same time, you have like a back and forth conversation with the environment artists who help you, uh, you know, uh, realize the lighting artist's vision organically. They're like, for example, the lighting artist like, I really want this scene to be lit this way or this portion of the scene to be lit this way, but I need an organic justification. So can you give me a light prop to sort of do that? you know, shape of the lights, the shadow, like the texture of the lights, all these things sort of like come into practice when, when it's a collaborative work between the environment artist and the lighting artist or the look dev, right? Right, okay. So again, iterative process, you go back and forth, you're like, oh, I don't like it. And then you try this out, try that out. Uh, but that's that's pretty much it. So that's why starting lighting very early on can be important or at least planning it based on what you're going to do later is going to be important um i don't think especially if you want the game to look great right which is uh, optimal <laughs> like, <what>? yeah <laughs> yeah I, it, it's important to have a good plan and have all all of this consideration at the back of your head um i can give you uh, topics to look up yeah. because again like if I keep going into that I, I won't stop <laughs> yeah I was I was gonna suggest that um, like what we could do is we could like in the description we could have a bunch of links of of things that you suggest so people can check out those links um, yeah for further yeah. knowledge and uh, implementation kind yeah of thing. yeah I, I meant like beyond that i still haven't covered um, a lot of aspects that might be oh, very sure. applicable to your project so i can just sort of like talk to you all about that later and just be like okay here are the things you probably should research and just like learn about on high level right um so it just makes you you know um i've worked with tyler before and he's definitely aware of most of these things yeah yeah he's he seems like he's uh yeah, he seems like he's pretty well well rounded with level kind of like knowledge yeah. and everything. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so and that'd be that'd be great. But I definitely appreciate you talking to us, to us about like uh, the high level ideas and like the whys and, and a few of the, like this kind of thing is just just awesome um, base knowledge to to know for anyone who wants to do lighting for for a game. Um, yeah, of course, man. Happy fantastic. to help. Fantastic. Yeah, thanks for thanks for all your time, Sarab. And I'm definitely going to be talking to you more about the specifics for this game because i yeah i definitely wanted to to be as good as we can make it you know so <laughs> awesome um i'm excited for you guys so hope uh all turns out well yeah all right thanks for your time man i will uh talk to you soon all right bye bye, bye rob thanks for watching this video if you enjoyed this video don't forget to like and subscribe to baka bros entertainment for more updates on our game development videos 
And just remember, keep on developing, bros. Happy developing, bros.